Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Paul, and I am an alcoholic. Before I get started, I'd like to remind everybody that we're having a bonfire meeting just down the hill at 10 o'clock. I'm going to try to get you guys out of here pretty close to that. A lot of the shirts back there will be kind of guiding you down through there, and they'll have the fire ready. And uh, I'm a little out of my element. I don't like uh, being up here, and only an AA request will get me in something like this. You know, and so... uh, uh, it's uh, kind of unusual. I'm usually back there with the shirts and, and sitting back there making fun of everybody up here, you know. <laughs> but the shoe's on the other foot tonight. My home group is the ABC group, Seminole, Oklahoma. I've been sober since December 30th, 1991. <laughs> and i got to tell you, I'm a product of this uh, environment down here. My first home group was the Shawnee Big Book group over in Shawnee, Oklahoma, where I got sober. And a bunch of them guys came down here and talked to old Bob White about starting a meeting up there. And after they started that meeting up there, well, it was a few years before I got to that group. But i got to tell you a little story about the times that I did try to get sober. I was going to a place called the Shawnee Original Group over in Shawnee, Oklahoma. And I had been going over there, uh, I guess my first trip to that group was probably 1986. And when I got there, there was a bunch of old guys sitting around, and one old gal. And they were just uh, laughing it up and having a good time. And I did not find anything funny in what they said. (laughs) And you know, they read something that night. And each time that I went in and out of that group for the next five years, they would read that thing every cotton picking night. And I wondered why in the hell they kept reading the same thing over and over. And to top it all off, the same bunch of people were still there every time I came back into that group. And they would read how it works. And I would think to my, and this is how a good newcomer thinks. I would think to myself, you know, them guys are going to have to come here the rest of their lives just to figure out how it works because they have to read it every night and hear that. <laughs> and I'd come into that group, and I'd stay sober for probably maybe about 90 days. I didn't do a thing but come and take up a seat, and that was it. I didn't want what you had. I didn't want, you, want what you offered. But I heard some things that made me really dangerous. The things that I heard was, you know, good, fit, spiritual condition. And I thought, you know, I was in a pretty good place in 60 days. And an old friend of mine that I drank with had probably about oh, two or three weeks, and I run into him at a meeting over there, and we got to talking about a couple of guys that uh, we had drank with, and we thought we'd go 12-stepping because we were in good, fit, spiritual condition. So we went down on East Main there in Shawnee, Oklahoma, and got down there, and uh, uh, sure enough, there was two the two guys we was talking about, plus there was two more. And we tried to give them the OAA pitch about, you know, how you needed to come to AA and get sober and just hang out with us, because that's all I knew, just hanging out. And before the night was over, all, all of us were drunk. And I stayed on that drug for about another six months and came back, and, and you know, and I kept... And the only thing I did right during that period of time, that, that five years I was in and out of AA, I kept showing up. And uh, in December of 1991, I, the booze had quit working and everything was just kind of going south on me. And I didn't know what the heck I was going to do. And uh, I had remembered the uh, remembered Alcoholics Anonymous. And as I came to in the, one of the bedrooms of the house that I was living in at that time, uh, I figured I better do something with my life or my life wasn't going to be, last very long. And so uh, I uh, happened to hear about a group that was meeting not too far from where I lived. Matter of fact, it was probably about four blocks. And it was the Shawnee Big Book Group. Now, I had my last 
last drink somewhere around between uh, the 28th of January and the 29th of January. I'm not sure which which one it was. But I had went, down, went to the uh, Big Book group, and I got down there, and, and uh, uh, they were getting ready to have their big New Year's Eve uh, shindig, I guess you could call it. But, uh, and I didn't make it. I, I stayed home the night that they had that big shindig, but I showed up the next the next uh, time the door was open, and I ran into a guy, and I sat in that meeting that night, and I ran into a guy that I would never have bonded with. You know, our literature says we are norm- uh, people who normally would not mix. Now, I would not have mixed with this guy. I would not have drank with him. I wouldn't even call him a friend. But one, something that happened that night that, that made a difference in my life the very first time that I met him. And he talked a lot about the way that he drank. Now, that I've told you that, let me tell you about why I think that maybe I suffered from the disease of alcoholism or even the isms from the very early age. I grew up in a non-alcoholic family. I knew that there was something wrong with me. I couldn't figure out what the hell it was. But uh, a lot of the kids would make fun of the color of my skin at at different times, you know. And and I knew that there And I remember asking my grandmother, I said, why do they make fun? Don't worry about it. You're who you are, and you'll be okay. Well, that wasn't a good enough answer for me. But I got along with the kids in the neighborhood. Our family was the only family that had two kids in it, and everybody else had a great number of kids in it. And uh, I think the biggest family was uh, uh, 13 or 14. They had kids in them. But there was probably about seven or eight of us that were pretty pretty much close to the same age, yeah, somewhere within one or two years, three years of each other, either more or less. And we'd ride our bikes down to the picture show in downtown Shawnee, and we'd watch these picture shows, and especially on Saturday morning. We'd go down and see these uh, cowboy and Indian movies on Saturday morning, and we'd just get on our bicycles, hustle back down to the old hood, and we'd get down there, and we'd choose upside and play cowboys and Indians. And I'm always holding my hand up when they're choosing the cowboys. You know, I'm holding my hand up, and they choose to, and some, for some reason or another, I always ended up being the Indian. <laughs> and I thought, this, that's real crappy, you know? Because you know what happens to the Indians? You know, if you ever watched a, uh, one of them Western movies, you know, the Indians attack, and all of a sudden, uh, they're losing again, you know? And, and I, and that was an example for me, you know, uh, how I felt, felt different because I wasn't chosen to be a cowboy. Now, when I got to the Big Book group, uh, there were some uh, folks there that uh, enjoyed being cowboys. And I, matter of fact, I rode down here with one, <laughs> and he, uh, he loved team roping. And I watched him over the years, and, and, and uh, I'd hear him describe all the aches and pains, and I'd come to the, to the decision that he can have that cowboy stuff. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be happy to be an AA member, I'll guarantee you. Cause that being a cowboy is rough stuff. <laughs> yeah. But I, I've, I've just been so blessed in Alcoholics Anonymous to be, be, uh, to have a home group, to have home group members that love me unconditionally. My first trip down to this conference was in 1992. I was nine months sober. And uh, my sponsor and a bunch of other guys came down. And the rule and thumb was, if you wanted to get some sleep, don't stay in cabin one with the Shawnee guys there. Because they would raise nine kinds, and if you, if, you, uh, if, if you couldn't stand it, get out. Move, some, move to some other cabin. And there was usually about 12 or 13 of us that came down. But we had a lot of fun. And uh, I, re- I recall the when I got here, I did not really want to come, I, I, because it was out of my element. I didn't know anybody in Texas. I really didn't care to nobody in Texas. <laughs> Matter of fact, I really didn't care to nobody in Oklahoma. <laughs> but they brought me down here, and uh, uh, they allowed me to experience the Brazos Conference. And I had, I think it was on a, a Friday, I think it was on a Saturday evening, 
after the, the uh, 8 o'clock meeting, and I was sitting out there on the patio with a, a gentleman that's not since passed, old Bill A. And he and I was having a conversation. Conversation went something like this. Paul, it looks like you don't want to be here. And I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, uh, you know, something will happen to you this weekend. And what will happen is that uh, people will come up to you and they will shake your hand or even give you a hug and smile at you and welcome you to this conference. And I thought to myself, you know, here I go thinking again. Uh, and I said some, some obscenity because I didn't know any better language because I was still new. But when he said that uh, you'll have a good time and you'll want to come back. Well, Sunday morning when we got ready to come back, go back to Oklahoma, I remember going and looking for Bill. I found him and I said, I'll see you next year. Other than having six years of commitment to service work in the state of Oklahoma, I have not since, uh, since missed a Brazos Riverside Conference, and uh, I really love it here. <laughs> they talk about the magic, the magic that you get to experience here. And I'll guarantee you, if you Sunday morning when you get ready to leave, you'll take some of that magic back home with you. Because for everybody that has been actively involved in this conference, they love it unconditionally, just like they love the new people that come down here and participate. And I'll guarantee you one thing. Uh, if you don't ever want to come back, it's your own fault. But I love this conference. I love the people in it. I love the people that, that show up every year. I was, uh, during, during the period of time I was gone, I, I was active up there in Oklahoma, uh, the state of Oklahoma in Alcoholics Anonymous. They gave me a few jobs, like being a state conference, a state conference, uh, chairman up there. They gave me a job at being the area, area, uh, chairman up there. They even asked me to serve as their area delegate to the General Service Conference in New York while I was up there. You know, and that's not a big deal. But it is being a trusted servant. And that's what you guys taught me here. As well as my old home group back there in Shawnee. Y'all taught me how to be a trusted servant. Suit up and show up when AA asks you to, ask you to do something. And uh, that's what I've tried to do. You know, and I've had a lot of fun. I was telling Lynn the other night, uh, when I was working, uh, we would go to, I'd, they would ask me to go to work, uh, go to a job up there at, uh, tire plant up in Joliet in the province of Quebec. And uh, gosh, if you go to a meeting up there, it'd be like being a newcomer. You can't understand what the hell they're saying. <laughs> and I remember this young lady came up to me. I had been to that meeting, the meeting there in, in Joliet a few times, and she said, why do you come to this meeting? You don't understand the language. And I said, it's a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, no matter what language it is, it, it's in, it's the language of the heart. And if you can, if you can kind of muddle through some of the, some of the language barrier and pick and pick a little bit at, in and out of it, you'll begin to understand that they're doing the same thing that we're trying to do down here. And I got to, I got to a, a little group over in the, in a, a, a little community called uh, Rodden, not too far from where I was staying. And for 10 years, I'd go up there every year, and I'd attend that meeting. And about, oh, I guess six years after I'd been going up there, uh, a gentleman whom I'd met the first time I went up there, he, uh, he and I would write and call each other on the telephone, and he would, uh, he would say, he, was, he wrote me one time, and he said, our group's splitting. And I thought, you know, well, yeah, yeah resentment will do it. And I, so I called him and I said, Henry, what's the deal with y'all splitting? He, I said, is it over resentment? He says, no, it's over a language. He said, a lot of the French-speaking folks want to keep their language and the English-speaking people don't want the French-speaking language spoken, so we got we, we're just going to start us another group where we can speak French and not even be bothered about it, you know? And I thought, damn, we do that in the States with coffee. I mean, yeah, and smoking, you know? I mean, it, it, it's just something that happens. 
You know, and so uh, Alcoholics Anonymous has been one of the things that has turned my life around. And if it hadn't been for these 12 steps and sponsorship and the people at my home group that uh, showed me how to stay sober at that time, I would not be here tonight. And people like you, too, also helped me. Uh, when I, <laughs> uh, I, I was thinking about, how many, how many of you guys ever went to, got to go to Woodstock? Did you all ever get to? All right. Did you have a Did you have a good time? All right. Yay. <laughs> Yay. There was a friend of mine that uh, he and I grew up together, and uh, he went to. Uh, he, of course, he he got uh, drafted and went to Vietnam. He was over there about 18 months, got shot, and then and he came home. And it was probably about the uh, uh, first part of 1969, and. Uh, he come home and he was, uh, he had him, he wasn't drinking, but he was, got that wacky tobacco boy, and I mean, he was going to town with it. And, uh, we heard about that concert. And we decided that we was going to go to that concert. And we was going to have a good time. And the closer it got, uh, more and more we prepared. Now, he got, he got him some, he got him some of that wacky tobacco, and I got me some booze, and, we piled in the pickup, and uh, and we told our wives we was going to that concert, and they said, if you go, don't come back, and we had no plans of coming back. <laughs> and we took off. And if any, any of you have ever been to Oklahoma, if you go up past Tulsa, there's a little community called Vanita. That's as far as we made it. If you get if you get travel somewhere, you're supposed to have money to buy gas, and neither one of us had any money. <laughs> you couldn't use the booze, and the, and you didn't want to use the booze to run the vehicle, and you can sure couldn't use the smoke to make that car move. So that's as close as Woodstock we got. <laughs> but we did. I mean, I did crazy things like that. Fortunately. Fortunately, I, I was able to get a job in 1970, and by the grace of God, and I don't know how he, he graced my life that way, I was able to hold on to that job until they uh, laid me off in 2007. I was drunk on that job. I wasn't a good employee. I was uh, not a good uh, co-worker. But one of the things that happened after I got sober was that I found out there was a lot of guys that were members of Alcoholics Anonymous working in that in that uh, factory. And one of them said, we knew we'd get you. <laughs> These steps have uh, have played a great role. I, I didn't know how powerless I was over alcohol. I didn't know that uh, something... I wanted to always be able to prove that I was tough. Uh, it was the bar fights that made me excel. I love bar fights. I love getting into them scraps. And the only part I didn't like was being handcuffed and hauled off to jail. You know, I didn't like that one bit. I was I was uh, on the skid rows in Oklahoma City for a while, and uh, I decided to move over to because I heard about a place over in over in the west part of Oklahoma City called Packingtown. And over in Packingtown is where the cowboys hang out. And I had, I still had my job. You know, I still had a job and then, uh, I could afford to buy some clothes. So I bought me some cowboy boots, some jeans and a cowboy shirt, a cowboy hat. Showed up down there at the cowboy bar. Same thing happened. I got in a fight and got arrested, thrown in jail. But I did see one thing that really cheered me up. The ladies were pretty. They wore clean clothes. They they smelled really good. And they had teeth. <laughs> and you didn't see that down there down there on the skid rows. But it was you know, that's the way that my life life uh, went, you know, until and when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous I thought my life was over. And them guys were patient with me, and they rude to me. I mean, they didn't really care how I felt. 
Matter of fact, the guy that became my sponsor really didn't give me a choice and a chance to say no to him when he said he was going to be my sponsor. And uh, I'll forever be grateful for him. Uh, sadly to say, the guy got drunk on me at eight years, but that's just the nature of the disease. It just kind of sits there and waits. And again, it was one more time it showed me how powerless we are over the disease of alcoholism in that first drink. You know, and when we get to that second step, I'm going to share a little story about the second step, and then I'm going to talk about 11 and 12 real quick. Uh, when I was growing up as a kid, my grandmother took me to a little Indian church there south of Seminole, Oklahoma. And I was raised up in this little Baptist missionary Indian church. And uh, it was a place that I really felt loved and cared cared for at that time. And uh, and I walked away from that over a drink. And I and as I continued to drink, I searched and searched for that feeling that I had when I was a kid. I would get on them drunks, and I'd, I'd end up back down there in, in Seminole at that little old Indian church, and I'd sit there in one of them little old pews, and I'd just be boohooing, thinking and hoping and praying to God that I could connect with him. I could plug into that source and, and uh, find that love and comfort that I felt when I was a kid. But it was never there. And I would just say, okay, if you're going to be that way with me, I'm going to be this way with you. And I continued to drink for some more, a few more years, and then I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I started working with these steps, and one of the suggestions was to find a power that was greater than me. And when I, I found, I wrote about that power, I didn't think that it would it would work for me. But some of the guys in the group were showing me some different things. Uh, we came, like I said, we came to conference down here, and I saw a bunch of them by, by their bedside doing their prayers on their knees. I thought they were just kidding me. That they, I mean, men don't do that. They don't get down on their knees and, and do that stuff, not where I come from. And so they... <laughs> I, I started doing I started doing the prayers I started doing what they suggested and lo and behold I started feeling a little bit better and then they then we got into this inventory process and I, and I did that fifth step for my sponsor and and, and did six and seven and and you know and when I did six and seven I came away from my sponsor's house you know I I came away with that feeling that I was really a part of Alcoholics Anonymous and the reason that I know that. Is because I couldn't stop the waterworks. It was hard for me to see driving down the road. And uh, I did what he suggested, and uh, I made my amends to, to I made the list. I made my amends to, to uh, the people that were close, and I and I I made my amends to people that uh, were no longer here, especially my my grandparents. And, you know, and when I got to, got to step 11, step two helped me with that. And, uh, gosh, it was just, it was amazing how my life had begun to change without even me doing anything about it. The only thing I was doing, I was coming to meetings, I was hanging out with you guys, doing what you do, and, and, uh, and going where you go. And lo and behold, my life just began to change, and, and uh, uh, it, it was amazing. And so step 11 says, <clears throat> if I can find it here, what's right there on the board if, if I just turn around and read it? <laughs> but I'm lazy. <laughs> Saw through prayer and meditation to prove our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying for the, only for the knowledge of his will and the power to carry that out. Now, I thought really that was something that you just did and that you just kind of blowed it off. And, uh, and I learned through the process of hanging out with you people that it was a, a daily thing. Because the longer I stay sober, the more and more the God of my understanding changes. You know, and, and the longer that I'm sober, the more and more my, my, li my life begins to get a little bit freer from that bondage of alcoholism. Father, I, 
the more and more I continue to work step 11 to the best of my ability, I don't do it, you know, 100%. But I make the attempt. And that's what they suggest I do. Just try. Try, Paul. The thing I knew about a power grader myself, I was only drunk one time, and my dad had a horse. And I was out there, and I was about three sheets in the way, and I decided I'd ride that horse Indian style. No blanket, no bridle, just grabbed a mane and got on that rascal, and, and we were just riding around. It would, it would have been okay if it was light, but it was dark. <laughs> and I was riding down through there, and I, and I, I remember the little creek that when you go down, you're supposed to duck. And so I'm, we're getting it. And I hit that dang limb. And next thing I know, it was the next afternoon. And I was still laying there, you know, spread eagle on the ground. That's the only time I ever felt Indian. <laughs> but that's the kind of stuff that we are willing to do. We're willing to take chances with our lives. And yet when we get to Alcoholics Anonymous, we aren't willing to take a chance on trying to stay sober at any time. I got guys I got guys that I sponsor that that call me sponsor when they were willing to call me, you know. Well, they only call me when they're in desperate need of, you know, somebody to bail their behinds out, you know, and I say, Hey, I don't know how to do that. You're gonna to have to figure that out on your own. Well, you're my sponsor, I said, Well, hey. If it has anything to do with it, the first 164 pages of the big book of Alcoholics and Arms for the 12 and 12, I'll, I'll help you out to the best of my ability. Other than that, I have problems, I have problems myself, so how in the hell am I going to solve your problems if I can't solve my own? So this thought through prayer and meditation to, to improve our conscious contact with God is our understanding. Again, you know, really took on a new meaning for me and it, it continues today. And one of the things I love about about this this step is says the power, the power to carry that out. And I remember reading in early in sobriety, you know, they they suggested I read the the doctor's opinion in the first 164 page bill story, and and I remember reading in there where Silkworth says, and and, and unless the alcoholic can experience an entire psychic change, there's no hope for his recovery. And then it goes on in, over into the chapter of agnostics, lack of power. That was our dilemma. I lacked the power to change me. I tried changing me. I even thought about one time taking up TP living. I thought maybe that would change me. But I found out TP living is pretty tough too. <laughs> we, were, we were at a powwow one time. And there was these guys sitting in the center of the ring, and they were playing that drum, you know, and that drum sounded really flat. And I thought, well, what is wrong with that thing? And them guys were just wailing away and having a good time. And I went over, and I grabbed a stick, and I asked them if I could sit in, and they gave me the old nod, you know, okay, you know, and we started beating that drum and singing, and I, and I thought to myself, man, this thing sounds flat. What's wrong with it? And they took a break. And when they lifted that drum up, there was a big old, uh, big old, uh, gallon of whiskey underneath there. And I said, no wonder that thing sounded flat. That's the only way they could play that drum good. Sometimes I, th I think about that stuff and I think about the way that my life was before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous and I can't imagine it ever being that way again. And I remember that uh, my current sponsor tells me that, you know, it can be that way again, Paul, if you decide that uh, you've had enough of AA and you've had enough of God as you understand him. I mean, that your, your life will go south and you'll end up just like some of the guys that we've had to bury. Tommy and I have been on, been on many a road trip together. With, I used to go to man to man. I said, used to. But again, service commitments got me away from that and and uh, I recall one time we was coming back from man to man. I, I believe we was coming back. We was either coming or going. I couldn't remember. But Tommy was playing a speaker tape, and and, uh, and it was apparently it was a good speaker because I went to sleep. 
And I woke up, and, and that, everybody was clapping, and I thought, man, that guy was good. And Tommy said, you slept through the whole thing. I hope I never go to sleep in a meeting of alcoholics and I'm because I'm going to miss something. Them old guys that were over at the original group, God bless them, they, they were just exactly right. You know, if I kept coming around, maybe this thing, I might get, I get something out of this. And they dang sure, uh, their words sure were true after I was willing to do something about it. Step 12 talks about having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. We try to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these tr- principles in our, all our affairs. You know, in Tradition 5 tells us our primary purpose is to carry the message. You know, sometimes I get alarmed by the way the message of Alcoholics Anonymous is being watered down. And I get alarmed that that's happening from the inside out, not from the outside in. I hope that we we hold true not only in our groups, but, you know, wherever we're at in Alcoholics Anonymous, we'll hold to that truth of our singleness of purpose. Because that's the only thing we know how to do. We can't fix anybody else, but when one alcoholic talks to another, that's the language of the heart. And you can't get by that. Ain't, ain't no way around it. Because if it hadn't been for that guy sitting across from me, from me the very first night I got to AA, I would not be here. I couldn't talk to my physician and tell him that, you know, I have a problem with alcohol. What can, how, how can you help me? He wouldn't understand. He'd throw some pills at me. But when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, you guys gave me something better than pills. You gave me some, some actions to take, and you helped me to find something that would help me stay sober a day at a time, and that was a power greater than me. And I think the spiritual awakening that came alive for me when, in step 12 was whenever I got involved in coming down here. You know, I didn't know that it was an awakening, but the longer that I came down here and hung out with you guys, the more and more I felt connected to something that, you know, I only dreamed about. And you guys were living it. You were living that dream, and then I began to see that happening in my home group. I began to see them guys and gals in a different light. You know, and man, it was amazing. I I was so I was so rebellious when I got to A. <laughs> I don't think any of you were, were you? <laughs> and uh, I damned God. I damned him every time I got a chance. And uh, I remember my sponsor sending me to a Sunday morning meeting we have up where called God working in our lives. And he said, I want you to go to that meeting for 30 days, and when you come back from that meeting, I want you to tell me what you heard. And I came back from that meeting, and I said, Chris, things that they're saying in that meeting, it don't happen. That's BS, man. It just doesn't happen for guys like me and for places I've, I've been and places I've come from. And he sent me back to that meeting for another 30 days, and I began to hear the people talk about how their lives were changing. You know, and the things that they were doing and, and uh, you know, how this unseen power. The only thing I knew about God was uh, what I seen, when, you know, what I would watch on TV when I was getting drunk. You know, every spring they'd show the Ten Commandments around Easter time. You know, and I'd watch that, and you know, and I'd see them pillars of fire. I'd see old Moses hold that stick up and them sit that Red Sea open up. You know, I thought, now that's, 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 a, that's a real power right there, you know. That's the only thing I could understand. But when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, you guys introduced me to a power that was more than just something I could see. Because when I started hanging out with you guys and, and shaking your hands and you guys giving me hugs and, and you guys saying things to me like, keep coming back, Paul, and things like, we love you, Paul, unconditionally, you know, that, that started making sense. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Do we practice them 100%? Hell no. We do it to the best of our ability. Sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not. But I'll tell you one thing. When you share with another alcoholic and you're sharing your experience of how, what you were like, what happened, and what you're like today, they'll begin to identify in 
Because in and in and by myself, when I don't have a program of recovery, I can't tell you. I can't tell you. You know what? Uh, the, anything that would make impress you. Let's put it that way. Because I, I could not impress you because you guys had already been there, and I couldn't do that. I remember one time there was a little gal sitting in the meeting, and she she was talking about uh, being arrested, you know, for indecent exposure. She said. Every now and then I had this breakout of unscheduled nudity. <laughs> and I said, and, and I was sitting in that meeting and I thought, hell, I have too. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's amazing how, how you get there and you, and you hear these people sharing their stuff, you know, their experience, strength, and hope in meetings, and then you always identify in because there's always a similarity there. And the thing that I, I remember, I also remember my, uh, I missed a meeting one time, knew it real early in sobriety. And, uh, he said, uh, where were you last night? And I said, I was home taking care of the wife. She was sick. And he said, uh, well, how many times when you were drinking did you stay home and not drink when she was sick? And I said, uh, uh, none. He said, well, I'll tell you what, buddy. He said, the best thing for you to do is is you keep showing up to Alcoholics Anonymous and uh, leave that little lady in God's hands. And I said, I don't know if I can do that. He said, you going to fix her? And I said, no. When we get into these little spats, I don't know whether you couples have gotten into these little spats. Yeah, uh, we were... We were driving down Main Street there in Shawnee one, one afternoon, and, and, uh, and I don't know what I did, what I said, I don't recall, but anyhow, she just reached over and just cold cocked me. <laughs> and I remember when we got home, I, I called my sponsor, and I, cause he always told me, you know, when something happens, call me. And I call, I called him up, and I said, uh, you know, you better give me some, give me a good solution here, because I'm fixing the cold cocker myself. And he said, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put your hands in your pocket and keep your mouth shut. And I thought, you sorry, SOB. That is not what I wanted to hear. I wanted your permission so I could cold cock her like I've always done. But he wouldn't allow that. After I'd been sober, while I asked him, I said, Chris, you remember when you told me that I couldn't cold cock my wife and that I had to put my hands in my pocket and my mouth shut? What was that all about? He said, I was trying to teach you, Paul, to start listening. Because you haven't listened to her in a long time. And you knew, and she hurt. You caused a lot of pain in her life. And you caused a lot of problems. And they suffered a hell of a lot worse than you did. And I didn't, I had never thought about that. But because of the, alcohol, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous in these 12 steps, you know, that, that brought me to a place of understanding that, you know, if my relationship with this lady was going to get any better, something had to change. And, uh, I didn't, ch- I didn't make the change, but you guys taught me how to make the change. The ladies, the A women, the Island on women in, in, at my home group taught me how to be a gentleman around you guys, gals. Cause, uh, I used to be word a lot. You know, and I remember one little gal coming up, I mean, uh, one of the gals in the group coming up to me and said she, her name wasn't, wasn't that B word. <clears throat> her name was March. And she wanted me to remember that. And that was my first lesson on how to talk to you gals. To call you by your names, not by what I thought in my head. So I've had to learn a lot of things. I, I wasn't a good, I wasn't a good husband. I wasn't a good father. I wasn't a good employee. I wasn't any good. At, I wasn't even any good at drinking. Yeah. I come from I come from the uh, a, a, a Indian tribe called the Seminole tribe up there in the state of Oklahoma. Um, I'm three quarters Seminole and a quarter Creek. And I'm two. I'm part of two of the five civilized tribes they, they, that the government calls. Now, when I got sober, uh, uh, one of the guys. I heard one of the guys say one time, say, well, I'm, I'm glad you're civilized now. Because when I was drinking, I was uncivilized. You know, that's what they call me. And I tried to make myself different. I tried to make myself different where these steps and Alcoholics Anonymous would not work for me. And uh, I, I tried real hard, but you guys wouldn't let, let me slip through the cracks. 
there was something about your caring for me more than I cared for myself that kept me coming back. And when you'd open your house house to me and, and you'd invite me in, you'd you'd make the, you'd make these suggestions, you know, you know, be a part of Paul, don't be apart from. And I'll close with this little little deal out of out of the third edition of the Big Book Alcoholics Anonymous. It's one of my favorite favorite uh, chapters in the third edition. God, to help me understand that uh, when I make myself unique, I'm asking for trouble. And it's called, it's back there in the back third, third uh, edition, and it's about a Mycelac Indian who got sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. I read that story. My sponsor strongly suggested that I read that story. And as I was reading that story, I thought, you know, it makes sense. Then I got into that last paragraph, and it really made sense. And the last paragraph says, To Indians I say, don't be afraid to join AA. I want to hear people say Indians crazy when drunk. If AA, if that be so, A is full of Indians. <laughs> join the tribe. And he took that he took that excuse completely away from me. And, and you know, and it seemed like after that, after reading that and hanging around you guys, you accepted me because I was an alcoholic and a human being that was worth worth saving. And you guys showed me the steps. You showed me what you do, and you got me prepared for things that were going to happen in my life. And as a result of that, you know, I've been able to do things in Alcoholics Anonymous I never would have been able to do before. You know, and uh, I am so grateful for that. And I'm so grateful that the, the board asked me to come and share with you about steps 11 and 12. And that's all I've got to share with you guys tonight. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.